Hello, and welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. Well, there's still that pending copyright strike on my video Let's Play for Call of Duty Modern um, Advanced Warfare, so pushing that back one more time, and this time I'm taking a look at the first adaptation of J.R.R. Tolkien's novel The Return of the King to the screen, specifically the animated version from 1980. The story of how this adaptation of Return of the King came about is, in its own way, a little interesting. After Rankin Bass did their own animated adaptation of The Hobbit back in the 70s, Ralph Bakshi directed his own adaptation of the first two books of, in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, with the books being combined together uh, into one film, with a third plot installment adapting the, the Return of the King. However, Bakshi's experiences during shooting burned him out on doing adaptations of work in, gen in film in general, and that, combined with a mixed critical response, left the overall Lord of the Rings story up in the air. Enter Rankin-Bass, or rather, return Rankin-Bass. So they had done the late 70s made-for-television adaptation of The Hobbit. They were a natural to fit up the, finish up the process, the project. So, they began work on an adaptation of Return of the King. They brought back Studio Topcraft, who did the earlier adaptation of The Hobbit to do the animation. They would also later do the film version of The Last Unicorn. Uh, and like The Hobbit, this version was made as a made-for-TV movie, complete with some pacing adjustments being made to put cliffhangers into the right spaces for commercial breaks. In the book and the Peter Jackson films, the story takes on four narrative arcs. Frodo and Sam in Mordor, Pippin and Gandalf at Minas Tirith, and the remainder of the Fellowship at Rohan, and to also a certain degree, um, Aragorn and company splitting off for the Paths of the Dead. This film simplifies that considerably by basically dropping every member of the Fellowship who is in The Hobbit and other characters who are attached to them and aren't in the title. So, in other words, Gimli and Legolas are gone, there's no mention of the death of Denethor's son, Boromir, and Faramir doesn't show up either. Instead, we have just two narrative perspectives. Um, the first is Frodo and Stam's story, and that one is relatively intact. Um, we skip Shelob, and we skip Frodo's capture, which was also cut out of the... Um, Bakshi version as well, presumably meant to kick off the uh, third film for, with them. Our other major narrative perspective is from the Siege of Minas Tirith, which focuses more on Gandalf. Which makes sense, he's a returning character from The Hobbit. This also leads to where the narrative shifts for the film from the books comes in. The film shuffles the timeline, so when things go badly for Frodo and Sam and Mordor, things go equally badly for the Defenders in Minas Tirith. Conversely, when things start going well for the Defenders of Minas Tirith, like, for example, the Riders of Rohan showing up, things similarly start to go better for Frodo and Sam. Stuff like that. Also, as The Hobbit was something of a musical, so the Rankin-Bass adaptation of Return of the King is something of a musical. However, the Hobbit had the songs that J.R.R. Tolkien had written for the book to go off of, in which the film adapted nicely. There's no such selection of songs for Return of the King. The few musical numbers, or few songs, that were written by Tolkien were in the earlier books. Not so much here. Instead, we have the original music, written by Jules Bass, with the vocals for some of them, but not all, being done by Glenn Yarborough. They have songs to be hit and miss, but there are a few that I like, and they all do try to capture the thematic tones of Tolkien's work, and where they fit in the story, even if they don't entirely succeed. That said, the appeal of these songs to me may just be based on nostalgia, and fond remembrances of watching this a bunch as a kid, though, so if you they're not your thing, more power to you. In general, The Return of the King is a enjoyable, if admittedly flawed film, which I enjoyed a bunch as a kid, and I still find enjoyable in parts now. It's no substitute to the final installment of Peter Jackson's trilogy, 
Um, and certainly I would say that the combined Bakshi um, Rankin Bass duology is no replacement for the Peter Jackson trilogy. But seeing it now in comparison to Jackson's work, I do appreciate how they handled some of the limitations they ran into with the film's presentation. If you come across the DVD set of just this movie, this one film, I recommend picking it up, as far as just the individual DVD of this. I do not, however, recommend picking up either the Bakshi Lord of the Rings nor the current DVD release of The Hobbit, or for that matter, the trilogy box set. The DVD release of The Hobbit, unfortunately, has had the majority of the film's sound effects removed from the, from the film. The earlier broadcast release and VHS releases and Laserdisc releases all had those sound effects in them, which makes this film a confusing and underwhelming mess. There's no real reason to remove the sound effects if those earlier masters were available. I cannot, for the life of me, understand Warner Brothers' decision to defang that film, the Hobbit film, by stripping it of all its sound effects. And I do hope an unadulterated release with all the sound effects restored comes out at some point in the future. The Bakshi version of Lord of the Rings, as with Bakshi's other, work, Bakshi's other works, relies heavily on rotoscoping, and it causes some of the film's characters, particularly the Hobbits, to look rather freakish. I'd consider this one not one of Bakshi's best works, and definitely worth skipping. Next week, Nintendo Power Retrospectives continue, and then week after that, We'll see what the state of that copyright strike is and go from there. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.